artists we have invited to this festival, but I don't have a lot to say about Um, so, I will, what I want to do though is to begin with asking each of the artists to describe the performances that they did. So starting from the narrative of <coughs> what was performed and then we can branch out from there and go uh, into personal historical narratives, political historical narratives, hysterical historical narratives. <laughs>
structure the identity, but this is what happened from the 1959 when the first countries uh, were given their independence. Um, the idea of reconstructing the identity. So, for me, I question that I said, if we haven't even started to reconstruct our identities. I mean, identities are constructed for the time every day. There's no fixed point, there's no thing as uh, the idea of Af Africa or Africa is an English. That she doesn't mean anything. Nigeria means nothing. Cameroon means nothing. Kenya means nothing. You know? So, and uh, so the, this marker says in the film that uh, when men die, they become history. When statues die, they become art. When he, but he's also talking about that men also are works of art in, in the sense that they become enclosed in the glass case of the cemetery. So the, the space of some reaction is very is conditioned to be that that glass museum space that it's become a cultural space. So everything that was there before has uh, has changed in the process because the town local with their own interpretation and uh, their, their own ritual on it. So there's no uh, there's no such thing as authenticity or origin. Identity, it's, so it's already been cannibalized through the other, through the audience. And he says that even in the in the 20th century, in the years of independence, uh, the Adam describes that the black blood um, has become a guignol, guignol, like a clown, but it's in different country, but it becomes like a guignol. So even in sport. You can see that especially in contemporary African art, uh, there is a lot of excitement right now because uh, the, the market is uh, very pushed forward into contemporary African art, but it's uh, that too. It's, it's uh, a big, a big construction. Again, the Kimyot is there again. So, you know, so as an artist, you will try to make this connected to us anymore because you, you are thinking that's already your Kimyot, you are your interpretation. Gender, your color, your accent, uh, you can't escape it. So that's why I wanted to work with more like a physical conversation. It's not about India, not about him necessarily, and it's not about the, also what the film tries to give the reference to, but it really is about uh, the people I want to connect with. So with those ideas, Everything that I said, <laughs> it really is about that. We'll come back to that question. Um, and also to your relationship to Marcus, to the insult. Um, but I want to relate the younger for everyone to describe their work. So, do you think you can describe what you did? Yeah, I won't describe in detail because it'll last. Right, yeah. Um, but um, maybe I'll go into the, the, the origins of the later when we talk more about the first one. But uh, overall, what I set up for myself was a, a structure in the room with um, like a cube, uh, or actually a, a plywood box painted white inside, uh, uh, and then another um, space in the room that was the exact size of that box, uh, taped out with a bunch of objects. Uh, that related to each other, and that related to me, and that related to the history that I was in discourse in. And then finally, on the other side of that, sort of this three pronged approach, um, a, a TV screen, uh, a body TV screen, playing this half hour video, uh, 30 minutes exactly, of um, a history, a history of performance art, of conceptual art, uh, and of art making that I was in dialogue with and have been in dialogue with for a long time. Um, and in the video, I inserted and edited the video, I inserted my body, I inserted other bodies into these histories, into these iconic moments, uh, or into these iconic images. Um, and this is a video that I've been working on for over a year, and I'm sort of gradually um, working over the material, and so it's changed. And it will continue to change, because now I'll proceed to um, put in what happened and to make a change it. So I started off with this very basic setup, um, and of course, then, Having come to the festival and spent a lot of time in these classrooms and looking at other people's 
his work, I started searching for the actual space that the setup was set up in. And the day before, John Cork performed in the space and had used the chalkboard and uh, with it. I thought it was incredibly powerful and brilliant. And I, I knew that I, I, I had to acknowledge his presence in the space and also his presence within the history that I'm, I'm discussing and, and the lineage that I'm thinking about. John and I have spoken about that sort of on the side. And so I started off the, the whole sort of event at some point with wiping the chalkboard in my face uh, and then inscribing the sort of some elements of the history that I was going to um, digest, spit out uh, in conversation with talking about uh, for the next four hours onto the chalkboard. Um, and then I moved into a complete shit show uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a complete sort of mixed event and, 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 uh, and uh, where I um, used the box as a tool to write, uh, to talk to people, to, uh, to push against, to create friction with, to challenge, to put my own body in discourse with the text. Um, with the actual uh, environment of the box, which could have been a stand-in for a white gallery, or white cube, could have been a stand-in for a minimalist sculpture, or could have been a stand-in for a, a, a prop in, a, in, in some piece of performance art. Um, so I used that box, I moved it around the space, I turned the lights on and off, depending on what I was playing with. I started using the objects, and using them in different ways, uh, using the ways that I had planned and scored for, and also then using them that I hadn't planned for. Um, and I also spoke to people and interacted with people as they came in and out of the space. Um, and that was sort of impromptu as it happened uh, when I felt like it or when people engaged me as they would to me. Uh, and so the space started to move around and the objects became messy and I became dirtier and more tired um, because I was also doing handstands and flipping around and trying to find new ways to configure my body in relationship to the space. And relationship to the people who were coming out of the environment. Uh, and so this sort of orchestration and body moving and environment started to you know, de-evolve and also evolve. And uh, I reached a point where I realized that I had kind of come to uh, you know, this sort of climactic moment and it was time to start um, tearing the box apart. And so I undid the top of the box and that allowed for a whole new vocabulary to emerge and a whole new set of conversations to happen with people. Uh, and a whole new set of physical possibilities to it by just taking the roof off of the box. Um, and after having done that, um, I then, um, you know, the energy of the space changed, people were off going to see other performances. So I started to take the opportunity to, to, to sort of start working towards some kind of a, uh, not necessarily a resolution, but an end point, at least for the evening. And so I started to clean up the room um, and uh, started to lay all the objects against the walls on um, sort of. 45 degree angles created a 90 degree angle, which represents the handstands that I've been doing. Uh, and so I cleaned up the whole space for two hours, um, kept speaking to people, kept you know, having these impromptu actions happening, uh, and, and really I think I got most everything. Uh, and I ended the evening uh, as people sort of filed back in from another performance into the room by um, doing a handstand, referencing the handstands I've been doing in the box and so on. Around the space, uh, having people lie down in front of me and go over them at their own risk and peril because I was starting to lose some juice at that point and lose some physical energy. And I turned the TV off, and the TV had been turned on and off as the evening went on and crawled and kept working. And at some point, I got way too tired to do that, so I just put my face against the wall, pushed against the wall, and I got to the chalkboard. And there, I erased the history that I had described at the very beginning using my face once again. Uh, and um, went, proceeded to turn the lights off. And the box at this point had been, everything had been laid against the wall, but the box was now um, sort of fit into the, uh, sort of laid out in the shape of the square that was there originally, so this box had split open, and the little light that had been in the box the whole time was still on. So this image of the box, and that was now messy, because I had written inside with chalk and chalk, and used my body to rub up against it. The TV was off and all the lights were off, and I proceeded to use the chalk that I used to the text in the beginning, and I crushed it and uh, made a little white smoke, which references to the title, and I'm going to talk more about that later on. Uh, and um, I made the uh, the Vatican's white smoke to announce the new pope, and blew it out, and then pulled the light. Uh, and that's gone, and that was the performance. So, I think it's a, it's 
the Spartan Mass version. <laughs> <laughs> So I had, uh, I had done the sign language, talked to you, and said something really simple, which was, um, I'm blood. Uh, I came here to perform. And, uh, or, or um, I'm a flow herder. Just very simple things, and just identifying with my audience and who I am. Because um, <clears throat> that's often the first thing. So then I proceeded to uh, have uh, an academic beatdown by um, four thugs. So they came in all dressed in black with balacabas and, uh, and wearing uh, academic graduation hoods, so the colors. And uh, they violently beat me with uh, contemporary First Nations essays. <laughs> And uh, proceeded to strip me down. And then uh, after that, they took my performance uh, breech cloth and, and breastplate and threw it at me in a sort of gesture to uh, perform. Uh, so, um, and during that, that sort of uh, beatdown, um, I was uh, uh, saved by somebody. All I felt was one person come on my back. It kind of was like a dog pile. So when you're at the bottom of a dog pile, <laughs> it had that feeling that somebody kissed my back. Um, but I was uh, sort of instigating this sort of idea of uh, my audience being witnesses to, to, uh, to uh, this sort of heinous act. Um, <clears throat> and would they react to it? Or would they not? Um, often, you know, the stories that made people get violated. Um, you as an audience don't get to see that. So it's forcing to put you on that. And, and thinking about Aboriginal art and sort of the idea of trauma and victimization, uh, even again, that just sort of speaks to it. I think it's the main part of it and see that. And what would you do? <coughs> and, then, um, and then the second part was sort of this idea of uh, ways of knowing, of trying to clean myself and cleanse myself and to, to gain strength. So my father, he goes up into the mountains and he fasts. He's a sun dancer, so he does some piercings and he dances for four days and four nights. But he'll go up into the mountains to fast and what he'll do is um, dig a hole, 
because it gets so hot and he'll wash himself and he'll uh, cool himself down. And if he finds water, he can drink it. Um, so the, that's the sort of act that I embody with him. And then, um, and then I sung a song. I said, I will sing to you. And, uh, and the song was a song I wrote for Adrian Stimson. It was a love song. A love murder song, because <laughs> he's Buffalo Boy and I'm Buffalo Herder, so inevitably I have to kill him to feed my people. So the lyric was, "I'll ride with you, I'll pray with you." So I was singing that out as sort of almost a, like a chant of prayer like to, to sort of ground me, and then washing myself at the dirt, cleansing myself, and then I, I put uh, paint on my face, and it actually the, that. Means um, I've defeated my enemy. So I felt like I've beat it. You know, I've, I've conquered something. I've endured. And um, and then this this being my last sort of performance for uh, before I got it, I guess it was just this sort of gesture. Um, and then uh, I proceeded to cut my braids off because um, it was a transitional change in the morning, but also a good thing. It might seem sad, but it's not. Uh, when somebody dies, black folk will cut their, their spouse will cut their hair off. But it's just a transition change. So I'm transitioning into music. And, uh, so again, yeah, that was just the end of it. <laughs> you have a lot of history to engage with here. Um, so I'd like to uh, return to Natalie uh, talking about both the historical, you know, political, geopolitical narratives that you found yourself in and also your personal. I tend to think about history itself, and I, I don't believe in history, you know. <laughs> I don't believe in history. Really. Um, well, so it seems like that's something actually that you share, all share, which is a disbelief in the
So in relationship to your to your narrative as an artist, in relationship to your own work, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you see this this work you developed here? You decided to make this piece while you were here. Yes. I don't see the time my piece is so good. I just try to think about material and movements. And then when I'm in the process, then I then the moments appear, then the clarity appears. So I didn't know what was exactly what was going to happen with the night. It was a surprise to me for at times. Um, I have to be in a, in a state of honesty when I'm doing my work. I cannot sort of plan where I want the audience to think or to see or to feel. Because more than that, it's really just a push. But you know, when I was doing my work, uh, yeah, it was difficult at some point. Because um, in the state of amnesia, but the amnesia, and yeah, also uh, I still carry a lot of you know, things. So um, the, 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 the skipping one was doing this with me. I didn't expect it. And, um, and I started to feel sick. And it reminded me of the, the state of invisibility and abnormality I was going through in my childhood. So this is the state where you don't know who you want to you want to into the future, you don't see yourself. So I was seeing myself. Some level it scared me like that because uh, In Gabon, you know, I, I saw my own family members being shot at, things like that. So, and then we um, came back into that place, the smell and the sound, and there was also the guilt of the ability, the cowardice, the cowardice, that I was not able to do it. And I saw them like this. So, it really contested my position as a human being, things like that.
Um, and so this interaction that we had was brilliant because of that. Because it just allowed me to play, which is what I had been doing the evening, and to, to highlight that idea of play and flexibility. And it also really surprised me because it made me realize that um, a lot of the work that I'm doing in relation to history deals with the pedagogy of it, which is why I was interested in the classroom. But how is performance art, performance art history, conceptual art history taught? And how are we recreating the tropes? And how are we how are we how are we structuring our work, our festivals, our environments, and what it is it that we are contributing to in reteaching these histories? And so here I was presented with the opportunity to not isolate this child or to not ignore this child like a lot of the history that we're testing, which moved towards more trauma, virtuosity, and so on. Um, and I'm not saying that I didn't do sort of acts of endurance or moments where I was focused, but you know, it was, an, it was a chance to acknowledge him and to bring him in and, and to create a moment of play with him. And, um, you know, being a child who grew up in an, art, in an art world, some of the best memories I have of being a kid were moments when artists took the time to stop and, 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 and acknowledge my presence in the room and invite me into the work. And so um, that was a total surprise um, and, 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 and a relief and, and, uh, and, and definitely a high point. You already spoke about the intervention. Is uh, was that a surprise? Were there other oh, yeah. relations? Oh yeah, there was. There was a lot. Uh, I didn't. I, I mean, I didn't. I didn't. I planned part of it, but I didn't. There was a lot of um, uh, just sort of saying suggestions, I guess. To, to But I was surprised how aggressive they were. Oh, come on. No, I really was. You it was put like, them into a friend? No, I did, but, but like just how sort of really into it they got. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all love. Yeah. You know. um, but yeah, the, the, I basically told them, I said, if, if somebody intervenes, don't stop them. Uh, just try to get them off. And then I said, but if two people do it, then just drop your shit and walk away and let it happen. And I wasn't sure if anybody would do it or not. And there, I just found myself sort of at this point, and I saw, I saw the sky looking at me, and I could feel you know, what, I, what I was sort of doing. So I felt like I had to go cradle him, as opposed to, I had to almost save him. Thank <laughs> you. 
吃。<笑>
semicolon, quite smooth, more or less. Uh, yeah, wait, I'll answer that, or you want me to answer that? You want to talk about that and answer, answer any question? question. All right. Answer any question. I will make up a question. Uh, when I talk about the shit show, uh, I guess, and in relationship to this, I talk about my position straddling the sort of an academic position and the theoretical position of the one that I'm a practitioner. Uh, and the way that a lot of my work deals with history, uh, and it's not just lived history, but it's also history as an archive, and the archive is very in vogue now in all arts or theoretical circles. And the way that the archive is uh, managed or, 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 or reused, and, and I, in, in, in my practice, look to ingest the archive, uh, and then throw it out, and shit it out, and throw it all over the place, and, uh, and then try to restructure it, or find where it's twisted, and how to re reconstruct it, or break it apart, and bring it together. Uh, and I have a very embodied form of archiving, uh, an embodied form of, of, of trying to rework the archive and understand the archive. And so the shit show sort of refers to this moment where I, I place the archive in a room, where I place the archive, and then, and then, and then, and then, and, and this process of trying to work through that archive and what that archive means for me in my own position, what that archive means for us in participating in the construction of it, and the continuity of it, and the future construction of it, and and what that what that is that constitute. So uh, you know, archiving is a messy process, and I'm always frustrated by how we sock the archive or how how removed we can be from the archive, especially in academia, which is where I am, you know, very much local. So I sort of tend to get it that way. The title um, of the piece, I've got to go back all the way to sort of the beginning of this piece, which was a year ago when I was trying to apply to festivals to get into it. And I was trying to figure out what it is, what do you, what, how do you get into a performance festival? Because I've never really thought of this. I was like, okay, what is this? They're asking me for like a 700 word proposal. And I was like, shit, I've got to come up with a piece a year in advance and give them like a thousand words that describes it. And so, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to really i kind of like really structure this and elaborate it well. And so I, like, I really structured this piece. Uh, and, and I really did. Yeah, skeptical looks on me. This one word. And, 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 and I was looking for it. Right. And I, and I was trying to figure it out. And, and, and I was looking more into it. I became sort of frustrated with what I was, what I was seeing at the time, which was this sort of um, uh, a different calls for proposals where it were specifically being demanded or where things like, you know, endurance as a, as a must. So performances must be endurance-based, or performances must be this-based or that-based. And again, really frustrated with these tropes, these canonical tropes that were being recreated by festivals, uh, and that were also being recreated by the academy and the institution I was in, where teachers were teaching us, oh, this is performance art day one, so we're going to look at naked bodies. And then on week two, we're going to look at, you know, bodies that paint themselves. And then on week three, we're going to look at this. And then Chris Burden, and Vito Conchi, and Marina Pravlovich, and once in a while, we'll throw in someone who's a bit different. And I sort of started to get incredibly frustrated with all these things at the same time, and, on, and, and also with the idea that performance art was, you know, always this sort of, not only this canonical history, but that it could not also take in political protests or other forms that were more socially engaged and that did not, you know, have the sort of artist who then went on to make shitloads of money and stuff, which is a result of millions of dollars. So, all of this being in me at the time and trying to figure this out, I, I, I was dealing with this archive of, of white men making white smoke. Uh, and I kept thinking of the Pope and the way that you elect the Pope, which is, you know, every these people come into the conflict and they let out this white smoke and this black smoke and everyone's waiting for the next one to be elected. And I kept thinking, wow, maybe that's what happened with Marina, you know, maybe everyone got into it. Everyone got in, waited to elect their next performance art pope, and then finally elected the white smoke out and decided that Marina was going to be it. And so, this proposal had all of these layers where it was like, you know, Chris Burton, God, I grew up idolizing that guy, because he really put his body to the test, but now he realizes he's just a dick. And it's important that he did it, but I hate him for it, I fucking hate him for it, but I fucking hate myself for it, because I kind of still like it, and I feel guilty about it, but I want to present another history, because it's I need to let it go, but also I need to account for it. So how do I let it go? And then how do I let the white smoke out and let the white smoke out and it not be Marina Bradfish? Because it can't be Marina Bradfish. Because <laughs> she's also become a boy, as someone pointed out when they came into the room and on the chalkboard there were a bunch of men names. And then someone said, oh, but Marina's there. And someone said, no, 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 Marina's a boy also now. Anyways. So all of these things were factoring into writing this proposal and this title. So I thought, hey, we're going to go out there. We're going to make a piece. And it's going to refer to the history and how we select who the next 
head-on show in Vatican performance arts. It works. I think it works. I think we need the hats. We need the hats. We need the people. I have a hat. You have a hat? In my storage locker. Oh, okay. I'll get it for you. Okay, obviously, the audience has spoken.
Um, and I'm interested in the way that both of you um, invoke it in different ways in your performances as a, um, as a tool for counter-historical narrative. Because it seems to me that honesty of your performances and the kind of love that goes into it is the direct opposition or op it's in direct opposition to history. And you see it out there. So 
opposed to the old so Yeah, it's one of the cards. Yeah, exactly. So that that was like to me that's what it wrong as well. Yeah. Like this like invisibility of going on what you were saying to this idea of being invisible or being present. Well, I think what you're saying is that it's the story is a, is a kind of institutional instrument mm -hmm. that I'm only to the Dakotans. Earth versus them, that versus this. That's not the same. Yeah, it, yeah. It's like a total amnesia. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing. I think if you find you talk, then you know it's, right? it's, it's going through. No, no, this is, this is, you know, it's the same if you speak about. I don't know that the second war, they don't tell you or what's going on in the other words, they don't tell you about, you know, the, for example, the, I don't know, the Nazi mother giving her milk to a Jewish child, but she's going to get Jewish children in the camp. That's not but why. You see the complexities of that? That, that don't belong to history anymore. Anyway. That's what history has. Yeah. Yes, you know. So for me, this is the this is the legacy. That's the history for me. That that person, the presence, however you judge her, good or bad, doesn't matter. So what she gave to that one child, maybe that's important. And what he became, and what he gave to others. That's his, that's it. Yeah, that's exactly what I like. That that, that to me is what what your other than institutions outside. It's a question for Terence, um, but it's open to everyone because in a way I find that there's a certain critical position even to performance itself, not just history uh, in your works, but it Terence, you said that even you felt that the expression of the thugs who were throwing your garments, garments, native garments afterwards, was an expression of now performed. Was it put a different spin on what was going on in my head after the performance that I saw last night, which was very moving. And some people in the audience have heard say it wasn't performance that you did, it was more real. So in a way, what you did for, for this position would be, what's your word, counter-performance. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, draw, I draw a lot of my work from my family and from things that I do in real life, or that I experience or see with my family. And, uh, and it was that. I talked about that. Because of the setting and the context, that 
feature, most feature, my opinion, uh, it's my opinion. Um, I think it's important for the audience to feel that complicit. I mean, I don't think it matters whether we intervene or not, and yes, we are a kind of schooled audience in general, but, you know, we are, we, we don't act sometimes when we should act, and it reminds us, I mean, what Taryn said, I just want you to care, and it reminds us that we need to care, and, and that's, to me, that's an active, um, uh, whether we act physically or not, because we know it's a protective environment, and as Natalie says, it's there's a trust situation going on. You have to trust the audience. So I think we're learning something whether we physically intervene in the physical or not. That, that's how I see it. Yeah, and now we've got like, the idea of the audience as witness, yeah. which witnessing is, is, isn't active. It isn't participant. Mm -hmm. Pushing it. Well, 
I thought that, Natalie, there were times when you were giving us signals as you were kind of checking in with yourself about how things were. And you know, just you would take uh, occasional time to <coughs> like, walk between the rows of cups and not And I'm always trying to find ways to flip it around in and out. 
now it's going to become difficult to locate where I am like myself on that structure. I don't know where to locate myself on it necessarily. I know that I appear sometimes in it as I do handstand and I hold it for a long time, and all of a sudden there's this endurance element. Whereas I write on the wall and I'm restrained and you're like, oh, you know, there's um, Matthew Barney drawing this thing. But you know, not quite, maybe. Uh, I'm thinking about him, but I'm also thinking about what he didn't do. And I'm also thinking about what those tools actually mean right now. You know, so what, is language, what is this language that this history has evolved? What are the tools that it's given me in order to create something right now that is interesting, that is relevant? You know, sure, endurance is interesting, but endurance for itself as it was there, not so much. But there are interesting things in it. You know, um, endurance, duration, uh, physical exertion, all these things. And so I think I'm constantly just trying to juggle those things in my head, but also physically not manifest them. Maybe that's why it's part of this locate me in it, um, but I do appreciate that. <laughs> the fact that these are counter historical narratives, there's sort of counter narratives in general as well, because there's a thing about narrative is it becomes comfortable, it teaches us stuff, we learn something, there's a form that we know how to follow. But there was a lot of bewilderment and confusion for me in, in, in trying to follow each of these. Sometimes I'm left with things that I have, like horror or uh, confusion or deep sadness and of course bewilderment um, that I don't know what to do with. And I don't necessarily have the same resolution you may have in having your body go through the piece of your position. Um, and I don't know what to say, it's not a question. So I know what it is, I'm, I'm just, and it's good to hear you speak, but I'm also even aware in the speaking that sometimes you're saying that I'm desperately trying to catch the thread of what you needed there. Because I know there's other points of reference that I'm not, I, I know they're there, but I'm not, I'm not grooving, sinking into, into an understanding of it, I haven't rooted it. 
big information, but it, but it's this counter narrative thing is very confusing.